Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Seth Bodner, and as the president of the University of Montana, I want to thank you all for joining the first ever virtual President's Lecture Series event for a conversation with Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, moderated by President Carla Bird of Blackfeet Community College. Today's conversation is sure to challenge and benefit every single one of us. Now, I'm sorry we can't uh, welcome you all here in person to our campus. Uh, it is a beautiful sunny day here in Missoula and you might just hear the bells of Main Hall in the background, uh, which play every day at noon. Uh, but, so give you a sense of our, of our campus, but I wanna welcome virtually today, teachers, parents, and students from across the entire state of Montana. Uh, we also welcome community members, University of Montana staff, faculty, and students and colleagues from across the Montana University system, as well as generous UM supporters. You are what make this 33-year-old President's Lecture Series and UM so special. You form a community interested in exploring ideas together and maintaining a continuous posture of learning and growth. Now, it's significant that we host these President's Lecture Series events here at the University of Montana an institution that sits in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. This place and this gathering remind us to be attentive to our history and to the many contributions of Indigenous people who shape our present. Many are with us for this event today. And by gathering for conversation, we're continuing a long tradition of shared inquiry, learning, and creativity, as well as our commitment to creating a more equitable, inclusive learning environment. And I couldn't be more excited about today's discussion. We are so honored to welcome Dr. Tatum to continue our long tradition of learning and creativity. President Emerita of Spelman College, Dr. Tatum is a clinical psychologist widely known for her expertise on race relations and as a thought leader in higher education. Her 13 years as president of Spelman College from 2002 to 2015 were marked by innovation and growth. And her leadership was recognized in 2013 with the Carnegie Academic Leadership Award. She's the author of several books, including the best-selling book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. Dr. Tatum's a sought after speaker on the topics of racial identity development, race and education, and strategies for creating inclusive environments. In 2005, Dr. Tatum was awarded the prestigious Brock International Prize in Education for her innovative leadership in the field. A fellow of the American Psychological Association, she was the 2014 recipient of the APA Award for Outstanding Lifetime Contributions to Psychology. We are so honored to welcome her to our community today and to learn from her. I also wanna introduce Dr. Carla Bird president of Blackfeet Community College, and importantly, a UM alumna. Uh, Dr. Bird has graciously agreed to uh, moderate today's conversation. Uh, president Bird's an enrolled member of the Blackfeet Nation and the leader in providing access to post-secondary education among American Indian students. She's also a friend and a valued colleague from whom I continue to learn as we seek to do better by our communities and to partner as effectively with I, as we can with our tribal college partners. I'm so grateful for her partnership, for her leadership, and I'm honored that she's moderating today's conversation. So thank you and welcome Dr. Bird. Now I'd like to welcome uh, both Dr. Bird and, uh, and Dr. Tatum to engage all of us in what I know will be a very enriching conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much for welcoming me to your campus virtually and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, President Bodner. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Um, and thank you, President Bodner, for the honor to be able to um, dialogue um, for the presidential lecture series, as well as dialogue with uh, Dr. Beverly Tatum. Um, you know, this dialogue sits very, very close to my heart, and it's a subject matter that is very imperative, important to all of us. Before we get started, I wanted to share with our audience members from all across Montana how our time together will go. We'll spend the first half or so of our time exploring topics and questions that you submitted in advance of today's conversation. Then we will turn to address emergent questions that audience members submit via chat. 
If you have a question you would like to ask, please submit in the chat box and we will try to get to as many as we can. Dr. Tatum, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here with you today. As I was preparing for this conversation, I initially felt awe and admiration for your work on racial identity development and on ways racism impacts learning environments. But my awe quickly turned to personal recognition to recognize in your work my own experience and that of our American Indian students here in Montana. It felt both empowering to be understood and yet in some ways heartbreaking to know that we will struggle that we will struggle to give our people and each other space to belong and create systems that do not disadvantage people of color. So today's conversation feels very, very personal to me. In preparation for today, I do have some initial questions to begin with. Nationally and locally, even in the most collaborative and respectful environments, having conversations about racism is challenging. In K through 12 and college classrooms, in city council boardrooms, in our workplaces, and even at dinner tables. This has been especially clear over the past year. Why is it so hard for us to have these conversations? Well, Dr. Bird, let me say I'm delighted to be in conversation with you. And this is a great conversation, a great question to start with, because, of course, our intention today is to talk about race and racism. And yet many people do struggle with this conversation. In my um, experience, having taught about the psychology of racism for now 40 plus years, I have come to understand that a lot of the difficulties difficulty is really rooted in our early experiences. And I often like to ask audiences, as I'm about to do now, actually, everyone listening to this conversation, I'd just like everyone to just take a moment and think about their own earliest, as far back as you can go, your earliest race-related experience. If we were all in a room together, I'd ask people to raise your hand if you've thought, thought of something. My, in my experience, most people can think of something pretty quickly. It doesn't take them long to call up some incident that they remember. And if we were all together, I would ask the audience to tell me how old they were at the time of this experience they remembered. Maybe they'd hold up fingers. Maybe they'd call out an age. Typically, people will say five, six, seven, usually early school years, you know, just starting um, to go to school, kindergarten, first, second grade. Some people will say older, depending on where they grew up. Maybe it wasn't until they got to college or joined the armed services or some other uh, experience that brought them into contact with people who are racially or ethnically different from themselves. But for most people, it's a childhood experience. And if you ask, well, okay, that situation you're recalling, what emotion is attached to it? What feeling do you remember having at the time? People will often say feelings like confusion, sadness, fear, anger, embarrassment, frustration. Um, sometimes somebody will say something like love or friendship because these experiences are not always uncomfortable, but for most people, the words will be like the ones I first mentioned, feelings that we would generally describe as uncomfortable feelings to have. And then I might ask, well, okay, you were five, you were six, you were seven, you're having an uncomfortable experience. Did you talk to anybody about it? Did you have a conversation with a parent or a teacher, some other caring or concerned adult? who might have helped you make sense of what had happened or what you witnessed. If I were to ask for a show of hands, most audiences will say they did not. The majority of the people in the room will say, no, I didn't talk to an adult. I didn't talk to a parent. I didn't talk to a teacher. Some people do, but most people, the majority will usually say they didn't. And I find this worth noting because if you know five or six or seven-year-olds, typically, 
they're pretty chatty. They don't hold back much. They don't filter their conversation very much. They just kind of blurt things out if they have something to say. And so the fact that so many adults now, years later, decades later in some cases, can still remember something that happened in childhood, they can still remember the feeling that's attached to it. And they'll sometimes people will say, I have never talked to anyone about that. I've never even really spent much time thinking about it until just now that you asked me. But what that tells me is that we as a society have told each other and our children, shh, don't talk about this. This is, you know, that secret that we're not supposed to, that we all know, but we're not supposed to discuss. And that message that we're not supposed to talk about race, particularly with people whose racial background is different from our own. That message comes through so clear and it's been reinforced so much that then fast forward to your college years, you're taking a class like mine, maybe psychology of racism, or just having a conversation with friends over lunch. And there's a way in which you may be feeling a knot in your stomach something like you're breaking a rule, like you're not, you're doing something you're not supposed to do. That idea that we're not supposed to talk about it is deeply embedded in our culture. And many of us have um, suffered from that. We suffer in silence. We all are negatively impacted when we maintain that silence, because if we acknowledge that this is still a problem in our society, racism is still a problem in US society, you can't solve a problem without talking about it. So the conversation's necessary, but a lot of us have learned that it might cause problems for us if we bring it up or if we, inter if we, if we bring it into the conversation. And so a lot of us keep silent. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Um, reflecting on my own experience, I would say one of my earliest memories on, on talk about uh, racial identity was with, with my parents and my parents spent a lot of time building a very strong foundation of being very proud, uh, proud to be Bigani, Amskapi Bigani. And, and what was interesting in my experience was as I grew older, I began to hear the narrative uh, about American Indian people, which conflicted with my parents' upbringing. And so that was a very difficult uh, experience to have growing up. One of the things that you mentioned was being able to talk about these things that somehow we've been trained to say, you know, that's not an appropriate subject to talk about, or maybe that's um, too sensitive to talk about. And so thinking about that, um, what type of ways can uh, language um, get us comfortable to talk about the issues that matter? Um, maybe sometimes we talk past one another when we use language that is ill-defined. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how we can develop a shared language as a way to better ensure that we understand one another? How can this help us to better see the systems we need to diagnose and improve? Yes, well, as um, I think your, your question is right on point because it is the case that one of the things that makes it hard, in addition to the fact that we don't want to break the rule, right? <clears throat> but one of the things that makes it hard to um, really have meaningful, constructive dialogue is that we are not always using the same language. We, it might sound like we're using the same language, the same words are coming out of our mouths, but we have different understandings of what those words mean. In particular, I, I spent a great deal of time in my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. The whole first chapter, um, chapter one, is devoted to defining terms just so that I and my readers can be, even if we don't agree, at least they'll know what I mean when I use the words that I'm using in the book. And I think it helps. So what are the words that people get confused about? Let's talk about race as an example. Just that word race, R-A-C-E. You know, we often hear people talk about many races, but in fact, there's really, if we're talking about human beings, only one race, hum the human race. Biologists tell us now that we've been able to, you know, do the human genome, we know 
that there's much more genetic similarity across groups. Even when people look physically very different from one another, they can be quite genetically similar. And even people who look similar to one another may be different in some genetic ways than meets the eye. So there's a lot of variation across individuals, not necessarily across groups. And so these racial categories that we all use, whether that's, you know, we use different terms. Some people say black, some people say white, some people say Caucasian, some people say, you know, Asians, indigenous, you know, there are all kinds of ways that these different, um, I'm going to use the term racialized groups, racialized groups have um, been described, but fundamentally, those categories are flawed, because we know that really, it's all one category, human beings. Having said that, we do know that people are treated differently based on their physical appearance, based on their ascribed racial category. So if someone thinks that I belong in a particular category, they're going to treat me as though I belong in that category, whether that makes sense or not biologically. So when we talk about racial groups in the United States, we need to acknowledge that we're all part of the human race, but we're not all having the same experience. So we know that the history of indigenous peoples in the United States has shaped the past and the present. We know that the treatment of people of African descent, has, Black people is the term that I prefer, um, has shaped the past and the present. We know that the perceptions um, of difference between what I would call white people, some people might use the term European American, some people still use the term Caucasian. Um, but what we, when we talk about those social categories, we know they have meaning, right? And, and that meaning is translated into what I'm gonna to refer to as racism. And what is racism? Racism is defined in my book using a definition shared by sociologists and other social scientists as a system of advantage based on race. What does that mean? Some groups are systematically advantaged in the context of US society, and the ideology of white supremacy, which is part of racism, understanding what racism is. We have um, a system that systematically advantages white people of European descent and systematically disadvantages other groups. Now, some people use the term racism or racist to really speak about prejudice, racial prejudice, attitudes that people have. So what is prejudice? Prejudice is an attitude um, that is about a group. We can be prejudiced about a lot of things, uh, not just based on race or racial identification, but, um, but when we talk about racial prejudice, we're talking about those individual attitudes that someone has, usually based on limited information, often based on stereotypes. Sometimes they don't even know anybody personally who fits in that category, but they've heard the stereotypes and they have internalized biases about one group or another. And I talk about this in my book too, that we all have prejudices, not because we want them, not because we think they're good to have, but simply because we're all exposed to misinformation about people different from ourselves. It's very hard to avoid stereotypes. If you watch the media, if you, you know, if you watch television, listen to the radio, read books, listen to people's jokes, you know, just participate in daily life, you're going to be exposed to some misinformation about some group different from your own. You also might be exposed to misinformation about groups that are the same as yours. You know, you were sharing, Dr. Bird, that your parents raised you to have great uh, pride in your cultural and ethnic uh, heritage and traditions. And that is a very positive thing for parents to do. Some people grow up in families where their parents don't do that. And so even though they might belong to a particular group, what they know about their group might be very limited or based in stereotypes. 
That misinformation is so pervasive, I call it it's like smog in the air. None of us want to be smog breathers, but if you live in a smoggy place, you will be just because it's the only air available. That's how pervasive the attitudes that can lead to prejudice are in our environment. But individual prejudice is not the same as systemic racism. You can be a person who doesn't have many prejudices. You might say, you know, I, I have love in my heart for everyone. I try not to prejudge people. I really work hard not to have biases toward others. Um, even if that were true for you, and there are people listening who would probably say, yeah, that's me. I, I don't have many prejudices. I certainly don't want to have many. Even a person who doesn't have many still may be participating with, in racism because the racism is built into the society. I use um, an analogy in my book where I talk about what I call the moving walkway. And what I mean by that moving walkway is simply something many people have experienced. If you go to an airport, a large airport, and you are trying to get from terminal A to terminal B, you might step onto a conveyor belt that carries you along. You can walk on it or you can stand still, but either way, you're gonna get to the destination it's, it's carrying you toward. If we think about the policies and the practices and the cultural norms that have been built into our society over many years that systematically advantage white people and systematically disadvantage others. If we think of those um, policies and practices and cultural norms as like that conveyor belt, nobody on this call started that conveyor belt. It was moving when we arrived. When we got to the airport, that conveyor belt was already moving. And we step onto that cycle. We step onto that conveyor belt and get carried along by its momentum. That's in essence how racism operates in our society. It carries us along by its momentum because it's so long and well established. And some people will embrace that ideology that underlies it, that white supremacist thinking that underlies racism but a lot of people won't. But if we think about the people who do, who actively embrace racist thinking, they are like the people who are walking fast on the conveyor belt. But there are other people who don't embrace that thinking, but they're still standing on the conveyor belt, not moving, maybe just passively standing, but they're still being carried along to the same destination as the others. It's only when we turn around not just turn around and stand still, but turn around and walk backwards, you know, walk in the opposite direction of that conveyor belt in an intentional way that we can begin to interrupt that process. And that's really what I mean when I'm talking about anti-racist behavior. Anti-racist action, anti-racist ac activity means you are taking some action that interrupts that cycle that interrupts that automatic process of being carried along, whether that's speaking up in a meeting, writing a letter to the editor, um, you know, engaging in protest activity of one kind or another. What you are saying when you do that is that I don't want to participate in this racist system, in these racist practices, in this racist policy. I want to do something different that interrupts that. So I think it's important for us to understand that racism is not just about prejudice. You can have very little prejudice and still be participating and sometimes benefiting from a racist society. And that if you don't want to um, see that happen, it's not enough to say, I'm not racist. That's like standing still on the moving sidewalk. If you want to interrupt the process, you have to work against it. You have to be actively anti-racist. And I think those are some beginning definitions that are really important to move the conversation forward. Thank you, Dr. Tatum, on especially the clarity surrounded uh, race and racism. Uh, when I was a student, um, I attended a predominantly white institution. And so my research was focused on 
um, Indigenous students who attend what we call in a research predominantly white institutions. But within my research, uh, we refer to them as non-native colleges and university using Indigenous people perspective language. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was one of my colleagues, when they uh, read some of the research, they said, they asked me, Carla, well, isn't every college that's not a tribal college, isn't that a non-native college? And I said, exactly. So we have 37 tribal colleges in, in the United States. Any college that's not a tribal college is a non-native college. Therefore, the experience of the American Indian student is that in order for them to obtain higher level degrees, that they do have to attend what we call are referred to in the research as non-native colleges and universities. And so it was almost like this, uh, uh, because we had that dialogue, um, it was standing in the perspective of an indigenous person uh, pursuing education. So one of my questions is um, when you talked about, um, you talked about sometimes pe people are passive and they tend to be in this automatic process, um, but that but we need to shift to being more active and working against racism. Um, so how do we bridge that um, in a sense? How do we um, become conscious of that? And how do we bridge that um, mutual understanding with our counterparts? Um, you know, our lived experiences are sometimes so dramatically different um, from, uh, you know, for example, when, when I was a student, um, my lived experience as a minority was every single minute of every single day. And now that I'm an administrator, sometimes I really have to make a conscious effort to connect back to that student experience. And so how do we bridge that with our counterparts um, so that we could develop allies and that we could make progress against racism? Well, I think that you actually gave a great example of it when you were talking about the conversation you were having with your um, thesis advisor. You know, he was who was asking that person was asking, well, you know, aren't they all non-native colleges? Well, the answer, if they're not tribal colleges, and as you said, the answer is yes, unless it's a tribal college, it is a non-native college. But that perspective that you brought to the question and that perspective that was revealed in the language you were using. Um, you know, was like, a, it looked like a little light bulb went off in that other person's mind um, because you were having a conversation and he was listening, that person was listening and you were sharing. And, um, and when we think about how best to facilitate that kind of learning, it really does come back to listening, right? Talking and listening. Um, sometimes when we're talking, we're not listening. Right, of course you can't do them simultaneously, but you know there are times when we're engaging with others where rather than deeply listening to what they have to say, we are in our own minds either preparing what we're going to say next, or maybe we're thinking about you know the grocery list we're making in our heads. Who knows what we're thinking about? But we're not necessarily giving our full attention and listening. Um, and dialogue requires active listening, and it requires and uh, uh, being willing to be vulnerable, being willing to admit you don't know everything, being willing to admit there's an experience different from yours and that maybe you need to know something about that experience. Um, and when we open ourselves up and colleges and universities are such an important location for this kind of listening to take place because so many people have grown up in environments that have been marked by segregation. So they haven't had much opportunity to engage with people who are ethnically, culturally, racially, in the sense of racialized groups, different from themselves. Um, if you haven't had that experience before you get to a place like the University of Montana, the University of Montana presents an opportunity for you to have some learning you've never had before, but you have to be open to having it, right? You have to be open to taking a class like the one I used to teach on psychology of racism. You have to be open to coming to a talk like the one we're having today. You have to be open to maybe learning some things about yourself 
that you don't necessarily want to acknowledge. Like, what do you mean I might have prejudices? You know, what do you mean I might have biases? What do you mean I've been participating in a racist system? That doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you're living on the planet, <laughs> you know, that you've been participating in um, systems that impact us. You know, uh, this is maybe a bad analogy, but it just popped into my head. It's like, you know, walking in this era of the pandemic, you don't know when you've been exposed to COVID, right? You can't see the virus. Um, you don't always know when somebody else is infectious, but sometimes you enter into spaces and you are infected because you've been exposed. In the same way, we are constantly being exposed to the infection of racism in our society. Um, we don't always know it, but it's there. And we have to acknowledge it if we want to um, begin to heal collectively. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Um, you did. You mentioned the importance of um, kind of individuals taking the initiative to maybe put themselves in situations where they're with diverse populations populations and they're open to learning and maybe breaking down some of those walls that potentially we are sometimes unaware of unless we do that exploration. So one of my other questions is, um, as young people develop a racial identity um, and a sense of personal empowerment, how important is it that they have access to others who look and experience the world like them? We talk a lot about the importance of people feeling seen, heard and understood. Can you talk about why making sure people see themselves and feel heard is so important, especially at a young, young age or as a young adult? Yes, I think it's really important to see ourselves reflected. And it's important to acknowledge that some, you know, if you are, um, if you're a white person living in the United States, you see yourself a lot. You see yourself on television, in commercials, in books, in curriculum. Um, and, and it might not even be something that you're consciously thinking of because you just take it for granted. You know, it's, it's always been that way. You know, you go to the library, you take out books, you see yourself in those books. Um, and you are watching television. And of course, maybe you don't see yourself in every show. And maybe your experience is not like the one on that sitcom you're watching. But there are people who look and sound like people you know. Uh, people you care about and you can identify with. But if you are an underrepresented, a marginalized group in the context of the United States, um, you don't have that experience very often. And I like to say it's almost like a, that if we think about college environments or workplace environments um, as being classroom environments, as being like a photograph. If we were all together in the same room and a photographer took a picture of all of us together. And each of us got a copy of that photo. The first thing we would each do, we'd all do the same thing. And that would be to look for ourselves in the picture, right? I'm going to look for myself in that photo before I look for you, Dr. Bird, or, you know, Dr. Bardner. Um, we're all going to look for ourselves in that picture. But let's imagine that the photographer who took that picture before it was distributed to all of us, digitally removed some of us. You know, maybe every 10th or 15th person got removed. So that now we're looking at that photo and even though we remember being there, we don't see ourselves in the picture. If that happened just once, we might say, oh, I don't know what's wrong with this picture. I was there, why aren't I in it? But if we found ourselves always missing from the picture, always, you know, I, I go to a lot of places, we take a lot of group photos, I'm never in the picture. If that was my experience, after a while, I wouldn't say, what's wrong with the picture? After a while, I would say, what's wrong with me? Am I invisible? Why is it that I keep not being able to find myself in this photo? I know I was there. And, um, if we think about that experience of, you know, I know people like me were there, but we're not in the curriculum. You know, I know people like me um, want to teach, but they're not in my classroom. You know, I know that there are people like me who have made contributions, but yet I'm not learning about them. 
And so we have to just say being affirmed, being validated by being included, being visible is necessary to maintain a positive sense of self and one's group. And that makes a difference. Even, you know, I'm sure you know this in your own research, but a sense of belonging is critical to success. You know, researchers tell us that the best predictor of persistence in college is having a sense that you belong there. And if we are able to convey to students, yes, you belong here, and here's how you can tell. Everywhere you look, you see people who are looking like you, or you see posters with people like you on them, or you are in a class and they're talking about people like you in ways that are affirming. You know, that experience, which some students are having all the time, is uh, not something to be taken for granted, and we should be trying to provide it for every student so that they can truly feel connected, a sense of belonging, a feeling of empowerment that is um, foundational for success. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the, um, you know, when, when individuals are, um, you don't see a reflection reflection of yourself, it could be truly, truly isolating. And in some ways, when we talk about students not being successful, it might not be because they have the academic grades, it might be because of that not feeling a sense of belonging. And I remember oftentimes people would do small gestures to, to make me feel welcomed as an Indigenous person. And they were so, you know, such small gestures, but they meant so much and some of those gestures were maybe maybe having some art some indigenous artwork in your office from a local Blackfeet artist or maybe they talked to me in my traditional language they took the initiative to to learn about language or maybe they offered a, a class instruction bringing in a guest speaker a, na a native person to connect so those always those have always been rewarding experiences for me, uh, making me feel welcomed. One of our participants did have a question and I wanna circle back to when you talked about um, sometimes we can be on that conveyor belt of racism and it's kind of that passive passiveness where uh, the racism is still occurring. And so one of our participants asked, um, what are examples of interpreting, or I'm sorry, interrupting the conveyor belt of racism? Well, here's an example relative to what you were just describing. So, I mean, they can be small things or big things, but I'm going to start with some small examples because you gave us some. So let's imagine I am a um, non-Native faculty member and I want to create an environment where my Native students feel included, feel visible, feel seen, so they don't experience that isolation. And I do some of the things you said. I go out of my way to make sure that, that there is some um, indigenous art in my office so that when somebody walks in, they see me as somebody who values that cultural expression. Um, or when uh, pronunciation of names, you know, um, there are lots of groups, marginalized groups in the United States who have names that um, white European Americans find hard to pronounce. Uh, white Americans sometimes have names that are hard to pronounce depending on where their families of origin were from. But, you know, I taught for a long time at Mount Holyoke College. A lot of our students were international students. They came from places that, um, you know, spoke languages other than English and their names reflected that. And it was important to all of those students to have their names pronounced correctly, to you know, for the for a faculty member to take the time to say, uh, rather than just you know mangle the name, to ask you know, can you tell me how you how would you like your name to be pronounced, and then have me practice it till I knew how to do it was affirming to someone that you know that identity is important to you. It's important to me to get it right. Um, those might seem like small things, but they matter. We could think from a bigger perspective about um, interrupting the cycle in terms of thinking about curriculum. You know, what courses are we teaching at our institution and who sees themselves in it? 
what would it take for us to revamp our curriculum so that all of our students saw themselves reflected? Uh, you mentioned that when you were reading my book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and other conversations about race, one of the things that you appreciated about it was that there was a section that included um, the identity development experiences of Native students. And that was intentional on my part. You know, someone recently asked me like, well, why did you include Asian Americans and Native Americans and Latinx? You know, the title makes it sound like maybe it's just gonna be about black students. And I said, I included all those groups because I wanted all of my students to see themselves represented in my book. That, you know, it was intentional. I wanted um, all of the groups of students that I've had over the years to feel included and visible and to see that their experiences were also important to talk about. Um, when we think about policies and practices like how we structure school budgets, you know, how we get access to healthcare, how we vote when we are having the opportunity to vote on public policy issues that might um, create a greater sense of equity among marginalized groups that have historically been discriminated against. You know, they're big ways and small ways, but all ways are um, everything we do can either be reinforcing that cycle, reinforcing that walkway or interrupting it. Thank you. And I think you may have answered one of our participants questions, um, which was how do we incorporate anti-racism work into our curricula, um, especially in the a face of community backlash. Um, you know, some of the things I know Dr. Tatum just mentioned, you know, making sure that um, we're inclusive in our curriculum and that we're representing diverse nations. Um, one of the things that we really worked hard, hard at, our, at our college was um, finding authentic sources. And so with our online language class, we, we went to an authentic source of an elder um, teaching the course. And so we've just been really creative in, in finding ways to um, incorporate anti-racism work into our, our curriculum. Um, Dr. Tatum, did you have any more um, input on how we develop that curricula to be anti-racist? Yes, well, the first thing, you know, one of the fundamental questions I like to tell people to start, you know, if you're trying to figure out how do I start, the first question I think we can all ask if we're in that situation is who's missing? Who's missing from this picture? If you get in the habit of asking who's missing, you will start to notice, oh, well, there's nobody representing my Indigenous students on this you know, I'm, let's imagine I'm teaching a literature course. You know, there's no indigenous literature represented here. You know, the course is called the modern novel. Surely there's an indigenous novelist whose work might be represented, more than one, I'm sure. And, you know, or thinking about, I'm a psychologist, you know, thinking about teaching introduction to psychology. A lot of people, whether they're psychology majors or not, will take an introductory psychology class. It's a common, it's a popular class that college students like to take. Well, if we're talking about um, psychology, one of the things that we teach in an intro psych class is research methods. You know, we talk about an independent variable and a dependent variable. And we typically might use um, somebody's research to uh, illustrate what's an independent variable and a dependent variable? Well, there are a lot of black psychologists whose research could be used um, or indigenous psychologists whose research could be used or um, topics. One of my favorite topics to include in a introductory psychology class that helps people start thinking about the impact of racism is a classic experiment by a black psychologist whose name is Claude Steele. And it's about a concept called stereotype threat. Well, what is stereotype threat? Stereotype threat is about the kind of anxiety somebody might experience if they're worried about confirming a stereotype that is held about a particular group. 
So if I'm a woman in a science class and I know that there are stereotypes about women's ability to be successful in STEM and I'm confused, I might hesitate to raise my hand because I don't wanna confirm that stereotype. I don't want people to think that maybe I'm not prepared or I'm not capable of being successful. But the downside of that stereotype threat anxiety is that if I, if I allow my concerns about fulfilling the stereotype to keep me from asking my question, I will continue to be confused. I won't get my question cleared up. And then I might not do as well in the class as I might otherwise do because I have not asked the question in a timely way. But there's research about that. And I can talk about that research in an introductory psychology class simply because I want people to see what a well-designed experiment Claude Steele's research was. You know, and we can talk about independent and dependent variables using that research as an, ex as an illustrate, uh, illustrative example. So those are just two you know, disciplinary um, approaches, you know, thinking about literature, thinking about um, psychology. Some people might say, well, what about chemistry? You know, what about biology? What about physics? You know, those are topics. How, how, do, I, how do I make the invisible visible there? Well, think about who's doing that research. In all of those fields, there are scientists of color. There are women doing, of white women and women of color doing research in those areas. Do we know their names? Do we make them visible? Um, and, you know, my name is Beverly Tatum. If, if the syllabus has an article that I wrote and it just says B Tatum, you're not gonna know whether that's Beverly or Bob, right? Um, so just making the names more visible creates information, gives information about who the contributors are in a way that we might not otherwise do if we weren't trying to answer that question, who's missing from the picture. Thank you. Um, you know, what's really interesting is, um, you know, even when it comes to research methods, there's indigenous research methods. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a whole type of uh, methodology people can use that are considered indigenous research methods. Um, yes. And it was interesting because even me as a, a doctoral student, I thought, well, isn't statistics statistics and it's taught one way. Um, but it wasn't until that I found a textbook that was called Indigenous Statistics. <laughs> And, um, and I didn't realize that until I was far, you know, far into my education. So yeah, uh, yeah, there are there are resources um, out there. And, um, and it, it, it does take in some ways a lot of exploration um, to find those resources. Um, Dr. Tatum, you did mention about, um, you know, some, we, I think we have to find ways to create um, anti-racist work into areas such as things such as a budget, things such as policy. And sometimes we don't automatically connect, connect the two of anti-racist work with something like budget. And so I know one of our participants had a question um, and it says, um, how do you address when there's underrepresented voices being ignored even up the ladder and tools for amplifying all voices? Well, this is where allies can help. You know, um, I, I use the term ally. Sometimes people say they don't like the term ally. They use co-conspirator or upstander. Um, but, you know, someone who has a seat at that table. So, you know, if there are people sitting around the table and they are all white men, I'm making that up, but let's imagine, let's imagine that, you know, a conference room and everyone around the table is a white man. There are white men who can say, this is a problem. We, there are voices missing. We don't have the information we need to be able to make the right policy decisions without more input. What can we do to get access to that, those missing perspectives? You know, if no one asks for the information, as I like to say, if we do what we always did, we'll get what we always got. And if, uh, you know, voices are, have historically been left out and they continue to be left out, then we won't have better policy. We won't have better practice. 
But um, if you're not in the room to speak for yourself, having someone in the room who says, we don't have the information we need, let's pause and make sure we get it, uh, is interrupting that cycle. Just that act um, interrupts the cycle. But let's imagine the you know, there are underrepresented voices at the table. And, you know, when they raise their hands, when they speak up, the point goes unnoticed. Um, you know, they're not getting the attention that uh, they deserve. Again, this is where an ally can be helpful. An ally can say, you know, that was a great point you made, Beverly. Um, let me amplify it. You know, or and sometimes people will amplify your point, but they won't give you credit. And then everyone says, oh, what a great idea you had, Mike. You know, even though he's repeating something that perhaps that underrepresented person has just said, but working collectively together in partnership to give space and to amplify the voices that need amplification is another way to demonstrate uh, solidarity. Thank you. So I'm going to look through our Q&A here and draw out another question. So let's see. Um, so one, one participant said, how do you respond to students who might say, I don't think racism is an issue uh, in this state, in this classroom, or in this town? Yes. So sometimes people don't see it, even though it's visible, even, you know, some, uh, well, it's not visible if they don't see it, right? It may seem invisible to them, or, or it may feel like, you know, I, um, someone might say, you know, I don't hear people using racist racial slurs, you know, nobody's calling people names, um, but they're not noticing the absence of voices. They're not noticing the policies or practices. And most importantly, I think they may not know the history, right? Um, one of the things I tried to do in the 2017 version of my book is put in more historical information about the way racism has operated in our society in terms of housing policy, for example, um, that the federal, federal government enforcing um, housing segregation as part of its policies in the middle of the 20th century and the legacy of that. You know, if, if someone's, uh, I'll let, use this example, right after World War II, when veterans came home from the war, they had access or were supposed to have access to benefits like the GI Bill, which would help them go to college or low interest loans, which would help them buy homes that they and their families could live in. What research tells us today is that those programs, which were federally funded, but administered locally, did not benefit all veterans equally. That in fact, if you lived in the Jim Crow South as an African-American, the same people who were enforcing Jim Crow laws were also distributing those GI benefits and you didn't get yours, right? You didn't have the same access to college education because the schools were segregated. You couldn't attend them, even if you'd been able to get um, the, benefit. And someone might say, well, you could have gone to an HBCU, but even though there were more HBCUs operating then than there are today, there weren't enough seats at those HBCUs to accommodate all the Black veterans coming home. Um, the housing that should have been available to everyone, all those veterans who wanted to buy a house for their families during the 19, late 40s and early 50s, Many of them were not able to buy houses in the neighborhoods where they might have liked to live because of enforced segregation. And so if they weren't able to buy a house, 
then that house wasn't able to appreciate in value, which means they couldn't have access to their house equity when they wanted to send their kids to college. You see the intergenerational implications of um, that discrimination. So even though we could say, well, that's not happening today, the fact that it was happening in my lifetime um, was still, the impact is still being felt. We can talk about that in terms of our current pandemic and the fact that um, communities of color have disproportionately been impacted in part because of their um, concentration in certain industries, you know, the so-called essential workers who have had to be on the front lines, whether that's as a bus driver or as a grocery store clerk or as um, you know, someone who is having to interface with the public and therefore being more exposed or because of limited access to health care because of where they live and limited, you know, access, I'm sure, um, in terms of, you know, Native communities, that's been an issue in terms of access, easy access. And now that the vaccines are being rolled out, same thing, who has access? So if you are benefiting um, from racism, you may not, and by that I mean if you have access to resources, if you have access to education, if you have access to good health care, if you have access to those things, it may not always be apparent to you that someone else does not. But if we understand that it's not just about individual attitudes, but it's about policies and practices and access to resources, um, we can more easily see it, particularly if we look through a historical lens. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. Um, I know in a previous interview, you talked about um, the intergenerational effects such as colonialism and colonialism um, occurs on a global level. And so it was just this morning that I was having a conversation with a colleague saying, I think colonialism has impacted every single part of my life down to the language, down to where we live, um, our education, you know, you could probably link it back to our history in one form or another. Um, you mentioned, um, I know in a previous in interview, you mentioned, um, uh, the impact that the recession has had on minority communities and that we actually don't even understand what those implications are going to be today. And, you know, talking about how COVID-19 has impacted some of our communities, our minority communities, yes. and we also might potentially not know what the, the long-term implications are of that that situation. Um, so I guess my question here is um, with COVID-19, we know that people of color have been disproportionately impacted and that impact is deeper than health disparities. For Native American people here in Montana and across the country, the disproportionate impact means our elders are compromised, therefore our culture and language is at risk. Do you feel that these disparities in healthcare, in lending, in housing, in any system needs crises like COVID to finally be recognized and addressed? Well, I'd like to say um, the, you know, in an ideal world, they wouldn't. But what we do see is that when there are crises like this, the um, what was previously not visible becomes so clear. Right. So the when we see the impact, the disproportionate impact um, in communities like, as you spoke about, you know, the loss of elders who are the carriers of culture and, you know, the potential loss of language and all of that. Um, when that when uh, uh, an emergency situation like the one we're in right now occurs, it does make visible things that we might not have seen previously. I, just as I was speaking to you, I thought about those images um, during Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, right? You know, seeing um, all of those black people stranded on top of, you know, flooded out houses and, um, you know, in desperate situations because not only were they black, but they were low wage workers and didn't have the means to evacuate. Um, in a way that maybe more affluent people did, or they didn't live on higher ground. 
um, as more affluent communities were able to avoid flooding because they were on higher ground. You know, when um, an emergency situation like that occurs, we see the impact of those long established inequities. When we all watch George Floyd being murdered on television, you know, we have a, a visceral reaction that brings to our attention the circumstance of police violence. And even though people talk about Black Lives Matter, one of the statistics I talk about in my book is that the, pop, the communities that are most vulnerable to police violence are actually indigenous communities. The rates of uh, police violence are even higher among indigenous communities than they are within black communities. So, you know, these statistics are not always in our face, but when we have um, situations like the ones we've had this summer and in this pandemic, all of a sudden um, there's heightened awareness, not just by those who are the targets of the inequity, but by others as well. And that in some ways is what is encouraging about um, what some people refer to as the summer of racial reckoning because there was so, um, the groups of people who were coming out to say, this is enough, this is a problem, we need to address this, were very, you know, they were very diverse. Um, it wasn't just one group or another, very multiracial, very multi-ethnic um, gatherings of people speaking up which suggests that we are at a, perhaps at a turning point in our society where more and more of our nation recognizes these are issues that we have to address if we want to be able to move forward in a positive direction. Thank you. And um, we have another question from one of our participants. And sure. I think this is kind of lends to um, talking about building some allies and building some um, support when you're working on similar efforts. And so one of our participants asked, how do you do the work social justice fight against racism and not get bogged down by lateral violence, lateral oppression from other BIPOC individuals groups doing the same work? Sure. Well, I think it's important to understand, um, as I talked about earlier, about that smog, right? You know, we are all we are all smog breathers, right? So, um, I identify as an African American woman. That doesn't mean I don't breathe smog about African American people, right? I mean, we're all um, likely to internalize negative messages about folks who are different from ourselves, but sometimes folks about me negative messages of people about people like ourselves, both things can happen. And to the extent that we internalize the negative messages about um, our own group, we can see sometimes, um, I like the phrasing that the person used, lateral racism or lateral oppression. You know, the um, you can see sometimes dysfunctional, that's the word I'm gonna use, dysfunctional behavior, um, and that can be discouraging. But if we understand that those behaviors are a symptom of the problem we're trying to address, then it perhaps helps us not, I mean, you can still feel discouraged, but um, not uh, so quick to blame, but more, but to remain focused on the solution. You know, um, it, this is hard work, right? Here we are, we are talking about problems that have been in place for a long time, multi-generational. And so if it took a long time to get here, you know, it's gonna take some time to undo what has been done and to create a new, more healthy vision for all of us. That said, it does, I'm gonna talk for a moment here about self-care. Um, if you are working hard on these issues, there's gonna come a time when you just feel plain tired, fatigued, like you've, you know, you've given what you have to give, you just wanna be left alone. Um, a friend of mine once said, if you make a lot of withdrawals, you better make a lot of deposits. 
And so each of us in our own way has to figure out how do we give ourselves deposits? You know, if I'm expending energy talking about unlearning racism and I feel discouraged because I'm talking to folks who should understand what I'm saying, but seem to not really appreciate it or maybe are um, internalized, have internalized so much of their own racism that they are acting in counterproductive ways, you know, that can be discouraging. I need to find a way to lift my spirits. And maybe that is going off by myself and meditating. Maybe that is finding a friend who will just listen while I vent, you know, maybe that is um, going for a run or a swim or some exercise uh, just to, you know, give myself a break. Um, these are particularly students will ask me these questions sometimes because they may find that they're on a campus trying to bring about change, trying to create a sense of belonging for themselves and other people, and yet they are doing so much that they're not, they're neglecting their schoolwork, you know, or they're neglecting their sleep, you know, or they're um, somehow burning, you know, that candle at both ends, as they say. Um, there are times when you have to pause and say, you know, I can let somebody else lead right now. I can, I can step back and let another person step forward. And that's perfectly okay to do. But we have to understand that the legacy of racism is not just outside ourselves, it's also within ourselves. Thank you. Um, you know, what's been really interesting this week is, um, you know, we, I think part of our BCC anti-racist work is always going back to the elders and the culture because that was our original worldview. And, um, and interestingly this week, I've had three elders in one week um, talk about our traditional way of handling conflict. And I think conflict is a lot different than advancing the agenda for minority populations. And um, our elders, I was like, okay, this is a very clear message, <laughs> but our, our elders said, you know, um, don't engage in the conflict and um, that the message was, and they actually said it in a Blackfeet term, um, but when you translate it to English, it's telling the person, well, you must know everything. And, um, but it was the, the concept of, um, uh, you know, don't engage in the conflict because um, the agenda, the true agenda is advancing the agenda of, um, you know, serving um, populations that have been marginalized. And so um, for me personally, I always have to focus my efforts on how do we get resources to our students? How do we get our laptops to our students? How do we ensure that they get emergency aid? And so really um, focusing your efforts on, I think on the work um, has been really helpful for me, although, um, you know, sometimes I think people have to see what, what works for them and what type of self-care works for them. Um, so it sounds like we have five minutes less left and we have one last question. So in Montana, like across the country, we are both anxious and hopeful about the future. I love that in Montana, especially in tribal communities, we live and breathe the understanding of that that community, our interdependence on one another matters. As we close, can you share with us our thoughts on the future and how we can, as communities, turn it, turn communities into hope, um, hope into action? Yes. Well, you know, I like to quote um, Dr. King's last book. He wrote a book in 1968, published just around the time of his assassination. And the title of the book is, Where Do We Go From Here? subtitled Chaos or Community. And in that book, he talks about the fact that after every period of social progress, there's pushback against that progress. And as people try to move forward, there, um, you know, when progress has been made, there's resistance to the progress, pushback against it. And I think at this particular moment in our collective history, we can say, there has been progress and pushback against the progress. And now we find ourselves either going further back or getting ready to move forward again. 
At the very end of Dr. King's book, he says, we all have a choice to make, chaos or community. And I think for me, um, that's what I'd like to keep in mind and to leave you all with. How we move forward is dependent on each of us making the choice for community rather than chaos, for creating belonging rather than isolation, for including rather than excluding. But that's a choice each of us has to make chaos or community. I hope we all choose community. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tatum, for your time today. Um, it feels like a really hopeful note for us to end on. Um, We're so grateful for your time and you have helped us immensely having these conversations. Thank you so much. I, I really have appreciated talking with you. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks. And I think with that, we will be closing our session. Um, Dr. I'm sorry, President Bodner, do you have any last words? Nope, not at all. Thank you very, both very much. What a terrific conversation. We uh, I've so enjoyed it and, and uh, have so benefited from, uh, from both of your perspectives. So thank you very much today. It's been an honor to host you here. And, and thank you, Dr. Tatum, for uh, for visiting us virtually today. And I know you're spending some, some time with, uh, with some other members of our community uh, shortly. So thank you very much. And thanks to everyone uh, for joining this afternoon. Thank you all.